So I was renting a room in an abandoned house before Jackass, before Viva La Bam, before even the CKY, I believe. Yeah. And there's this woman who has this stroller and she, there's a baby in this stroller and the baby's kind of crying. They're smoking crack. It's five in the morning in this abandoned house. And I had $10 stashed in my sock, which I always saved for the morning so I could get more dope. They, somehow they knew and they called, my two friends were outside and they called me back in and I go in and they start like asking me for money. I, say, I don't have it, I don't have it. And they're searching me and I'm fighting. And, and I hear the other girl say, give me the knife, give me the knife. And I would not give this $10 up. It was my lifeline. And all of a sudden I feel this puncture in my head twice. Like kind of grab out of it and it's an ink pen. And at that point, when I knew that they were not going to stop, I was easily overpowered because the woman was big. She just got out of rehab. I then gave the $10 up and ran out. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, we got a little sunshine in San Diego as we're approaching a summertime and it feels like summer outside, but I'm really excited for our guest today. I got someone who was a pro skateboarder he was a uh, personality on MTV Jackass. I got my man, Brandon Novak. Brandon, welcome to the show. Oh, man, I'm, I'm stoked to be here. This is, uh, it's right. I've, I've hung out in this area a lot. I've jogged across the street, and I had no idea that you had this beautiful deal going on here. Yeah, dude. Um, we're here local, man, and next time you're around, man, you're welcome to stop by and uh, talk shop anytime, brother. Dude, you have that, like, easy kind of 98... Point three jazz Sunday morning kind of voice <laughs> going on. It's 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 soothing. I appreciate that, man. That's that's the first time I heard that with the smooth jazz. But uh, I'll take I'll take what I can get. Sure, um, dude. So we know a lot of the same people, man. So like Danny Way, pro pro skater. He's in the industry scene. I see him at all the parties and and stuff down here in San Diego. And uh, Mikey Taylor, a uh, friend yeah, of mine, he's been on the love pod. Mikey. He's coming back in two weeks. We're gonna rip a pod and then do a meetup together. He's in the real estate space now as well. And he's uh, a big mayor, right? Or yeah, dude, he's uh he's in politics up there in politics, like um, in LA. I want to say it's Van Nuys or no Thousand Oaks. He killed it. Yeah, killing it, man. I love seeing people just kind of overcome obstacles and, and get into things just because of a, a simple idea. Yeah, and he's building like big apartment buildings, like San Diego up in LA. Um, so he's been doing a lot of stuff, and he's got a, a real estate fund. So he's got all these investors, and they're doing all these big you know, $30, $40 million real estate projects. And uh, yeah, he's a good dude. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mikey. He's good Same, dude. same. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, Brandon Turner. Uh, we're not talking real estate, Brandon Turner, although you did rip a podcast, the Better Life podcast with Brandon out in Maui. But Brandon Turner, skateboarder, is one of your good friends. I have not met him, but uh, I didn't know. It was news to me. You told me uh, that he lives here in San Diego. Yeah, he's a San Diego guy. I will actually see him for lunch after this. And ironically, the Brandon Turner of Maui shared with me a story because when i was originally told about this brandon turner podcast of maui i'm like it's not my brandon turner and and uh, i he sent me a picture of the brandon turner of maui and that guy's white and my guy is not yeah. so i'm like okay so it's not the same yeah but then when i met brandon turner of maui he's like yeah that was one of my like aspirations and goals was to to have me be on the top of the Google search before that Brandon Turner. So he like used that as motivation and incentive to like work his ass off to be above my Brandon Turner here in his world. It's crazy how everyone's kind of connected. Like I feel like we're always just like one connection or one relationship or one handshake away from like being connected to anyone in the universe. Legit. Um, I'll give you an example. Like I've never met Tony Hawk, but like a couple of my podcast guests and friends of mine, so like Jeff Fenster, he founded Everbowl. Um, uh, I believe Tony Hawk's like a big investor. And then uh, Brian Malarkey. Brian Malarkey is like top chef. He's founded all these like famous restaurants. And uh, Tony Hawk's like one of, their, one of his biggest investors. And so, um, and, and, and you're friends with Tony Hawk. I know Tony was part of your, your upbringing as a skateboarder, yeah. but I feel like everyone is connected just through, you know, one or two handshakes. It's, it's freaking 100%. crazy, man. 100%. And energy. You know, energy is such a big thing. And that's the rad thing for me about life when I kind of got into the zone of my spiritual journey that I, I embarked on, um, it's, it's really easy for me to look back and recognize the synchronicity of life's events that have landed me in rooms with individuals that otherwise, like, I would never have recognized the connection. How did you meet Tony Hawk? So I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and um, I, I got my first skateboard as a kid, seven years old. And, and the moment that board touched my hand, I knew that like skateboarding was going to be my life. And, and that's all that I 
cared about, thought about, and consumed. I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, I dreamt it. And from Baltimore was another protege, uh, Bucky Lasik. He, he hails from Baltimore. He's a big pipe seater, right? Yeah. Half yeah. Pipe. Him and Tony are thick as thieves. Yeah. And um, Bucky kind of recognized that I had this talent at a young age. So he took me under his wing and got me sponsored by Pal, which Bucky was pro for at the time, who Tony also rode for back before he created Birdhouse. And I got on the flow team and then I kind of worked my way up to getting free wheels and riding for the wheel company of Pow. And then slowly but surely I, I, I you know, was a full blown team rider. And as a kid, Bucky and I would go out to stay with Tony during the summer and skate his ramps. And, and it was just such a rad experience. It was kind of like the equivalent to a six year old meeting Santa Claus. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I was in it and everything I had cared or dreamed about or hoped to achieve had become my reality. And it's funny looking back then, I kind of possessed this, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say talent, but really just this mentality of, uh, despite any and all adverse consequences that come my way, I always do what I had to get, do what I had to do in order to get what I wanted to get, you know, and that transcended into other areas of my life too. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned birdhouse. So I, I grew up skateboarding myself and uh, I used to ride birdhouse decks. Yeah. Um, and so I remember watching all the videos, uh, the, the CKY videos, um, all the uh, what was the one? What was it called? 411 or something like that? 411. 411. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. were good skate videos. Shout out Johnny Schilleroff. He was the one that created 411, who then created Element Skateboards. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I remember skating back in the day and, like, you know, we would pop in the VHS tapes and watch all those freaking videos. Um, so, you as a kid, you would watch Tony Hawk, Bucky Lasik on video. And that's why when you met him, you were like kind of inspired. For sure. Yeah. It just kind of, you know, I remember as a kid, idolizing Bucky and, and he was tangible, right? He was from Baltimore. So I skate with him every day, but I, I, I emulate him to the fullest. I, I would dress like him. I, I would skate like him. I had the same kind of style as him. And you know, he was what I wanted to be yeah, as yeah. a human being. Did you skate with uh, Danny way growing up? Not so much. Uh, cause he was a West coast guy. So the only introduction or relationship that I'd have with the West coast is when I would come out here with Bucky, but at that time, the POW warehouse was yeah. in Santa Barbara. Mm. So we would go stay at, there was this thing called the POW house right next to the, the humongous warehouse that POW used to have in Santa Barbara. And uh, that was as far as I made it, usually in California, the Santa Barbara area. Yeah. I've always been curious, like when you guys go do these, these skate videos, you know, a video would be like 45 minutes, maybe an hour long. But I know there's a lot more that goes into the filming. Walk me through, like, what does a, a filming look like to put together a one hour skate video? Fuck. I, I can't speak for a one hour video because that's just multiple people, all multiple right? parts. Yeah. But each individual part, you know, can take a year, you know, of traveling all over the world and, and heartache and sadness and, and anger and frustration, but also love and, and beauty and resilience. Um, it, it kind of embodies every human emotion that one possesses. Mm -hmm. And again, skateboarding is literally and largely why and who I am today. And, you know, by social standards, somewhat of a successful individual because skateboarding taught me that, that failure was not an option, right? And, and no was unacceptable. Look at skateboarders. They try tricks for days, yeah. weeks, months, years. It's, it's never like, oh, I'm going to toy with this for a week. And if I don't get it, I move on. And, and then we get it and it's just on to the next. Yeah, absolutely, man. And then I can imagine like, like all the wear and tear on your body too. Dude, I, so I'm, to put in perspective, uh, I'm 46 now, at 44, I put out my last video part and I filmed a lot of it in Barcelona mm -hmm. and, um, at what age? At 44. Dude, I can't imagine that. Cause like I'm 38 right now and I, I grew up, uh, playing basketball, baseball, and I skateboarded. I skateboarded till I was probably like, um, 12 or 13. But like all that wear and tear between the basketball and the skateboarding, I stopped running and doing like high intense stuff, like maybe like five years ago. So now I just walk and like weight lift. For I do sure. Hiking, and my body's never felt healthier. Like I, I've, it's felt the best I've ever felt. 
but like I cannot imagine, dude. If I got on a skateboard right now, I would probably do like two tricks and I'd be like aching. So I cannot imagine you. You did a whole skate video at age forty. What a video part at forty four. Fuck, dude. And that's so I, I filmed a lot of it in Barcelona. Okay. And, and my days were spent skating and filming, and my nights were spent at, at this place called Spa Ari, which is the most amazing spa. And there's like five of them in the world. Um, it, it, it's just it's to reheal and recoup my body. Yeah. yeah. You know. But I don't know, my body doesn't really understand like moderation in skateboarding or really much of anything, to tell you the truth. I've never been kind of like a half in guy. Um, like I, I'm in it, I'm all about it, or I just kind of don't partake. Yeah, yeah, I got a question. So like a, a lot of uh, athletes in the mainstream sports, a lot of the higher ones, the LeBron James, the, the Kobe Bryants, um, and he, all these, these folks that are on these professional teams now, they got nutritionists and they got all these trainers and um, their fitness, everything is dialed in uh, based on their metabolism and they got this whole regimen. Like they say LeBron James drops like 10 million a year on like just his, his body. You guys as skateboarders, maybe today's age, do, are these new school skateboarders, do they have all this, this stuff that these, these pro athletes have in these other sports? They do, they're, they're totally dialing into that. Uh, I don't know to the extent of LeBron financially, but they are, uh, there's coaches. My dear friend and, and teammate, team rider uh jagger eaton mm -hmm. is um you know probably gonna win the olympics this year you know it's now become an olympic sport so what's funny is that like you know skateboarding is a crime those stickers back in the day to now it like being an olympic sport um and johnny shiloff again the guy who had created element who then sold that to billabong and then opened uh started the heart supply which is the the board company that I ride for the video part I put out through he is now the um head team manager for anything skateboarding related with the Olympics and Jagger Eaton rides for them so it's I mean myself I it took me a lot later in life especially after the life I lived to realize that my body is my temple and it's 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 what I have and I I should cherish it as such and especially with this beautiful life I've been blessed with that I really want to stick around for as much as possible. So I, you know, hire a trainer that I work with five days a week. I, I, I'm on a strict regiment of what I eat five days a week. You know, I, I'm very routine. Hey, you look great, man. You look great. At 46, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in physically, mentally, spiritually, financially. It's kind of like, you're like, like anti Benjamin you're, Buttoned. Yeah, you're like anti reverse aging. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but heroin preserved me in a lot of ways. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about all that stuff. But yeah. um, but I'm curious, man. So at what point did it go from the skateboarding uh and then into the jackass? Because like I'm curious because you know, skateboarding and then jackass came out. I know it was a really popular thing, but how did the jackass thing come to fruition? Well, again, the the common denominator through all of that is skateboarding, right? And that seems to be the glue that's attracted, pulled and held all that together. So I came up through the era of the East Coast, Bucky Lasik, and then met one of my best friends, Bam Margera at a skate park as a kid. Him and I then later on became best friends and you know, he really did a lot for me to help me. And, um, in that process, he brought me to his house and that's when he was making the CKY videos. And the CKY video was the first thing that began to kind of make him a, a household name. And, and the first thing that produced a, a large fucking volume of cash. Uh, and then from that, the Viva La Bam deal kind of came apart together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through, I remember that on MTV, right? Yeah, yeah, through that. And then through that, Jackass, a lot of the guys through Jackass were from Big Brother magazine. So Big Brother, Knoxville, uh, Rick Kosick, Jeff Tremaine, Sean Cliver, those guys had connected through the skateboarding world with Bam because he was making those CKY videos. And they were already like creating the Jackass uh, deal of the West Coast. So that's kind of what what gave birth to. Yeah, were, were everyone on Jackass, they were all uh, pro skaters? No, no, no. Just kind of ran within that world. Just ran with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. six degrees of separation like we were talking about before, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. How old were all you guys um, when, when Jack's, Jackass first started? So for me, I came in later. I, I had no part of the first one. I came in at two and 2.5 and after that, I 
venture to say maybe 26 um, the timelines aren't great for me. My life was a blur for a lot of years. Yeah, no, I, no, I imagine, dude. Yeah, so for me, I think when all that stuff came out, I'm, I'm probably seven years younger than you. Right now, I'm 38. And so um, I remember watching Jackass as a kid. But, you know, as a kid, you're watching people that are, you know, 24, 25. They seem much older. For sure. But now if I was to see that today, my perspective is different. I'd probably be like, damn, these are young kids. For you know? sure. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. But uh, I, mean, I do remember watching it on TV. I mean, it was a, it was a popular thing uh, in middle school, elementary school. All the kids were watching it, talking about it. Uh, you guys were uh, inspiring a lot of people uh, in all sorts of different ways. They for sure, you know, caught lightning in a bottle at that moment. You know, the timing and, and, and everything just aligned. And it created a really magical, beautiful outcome uh, with amazing relationships and memories that will last forever. With a know? lot of these stunts that you guys were doing, um, you know, because in the, in the viewer's eyes, it's like you see the, the, the one stunt. Were you guys having multiple takes for this or was it typically one and done? In a perfect world, one and done, you know, because the, the goal of that was never to like do it successfully. Quite the contrary. It was always like the worse it went, the better it was. Yeah. The more, and the more eyeballs you get. The more gnarlier it was, <laughs> the better outcome it is. And, and you hope that you don't have to run it again. Yeah. 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 What, what was the craziest injury that you ever saw when you guys were shooting? I can't say of like what I saw, but I can speak for mine. And mine was when I had got a concussion and I, I broke all my ribs at the same time on mm. one stunt. You How know, did you do that? It was this stunt called Doo Doo Falls. And I'm, I'm sitting on a toilet on the top of Bam's ramp in his backyard. And it's maybe 12, 13 foot up a roll-in, but the roll-in kind of goes over vert. And it's about maybe four, I wouldn't even say maybe two, maybe a foot or two wide. So it's a really skinny roll in and, and I'm sitting on a toilet with my pants down reading a newspaper and I wasn't going to wear a helmet for it. Right. And I, I just literally, my pants are down. I'm sitting on this porcelain toilet and I'm about to roll and the toilet's in. on top of a skateboard. It's on top of wheels. Oh yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be a free, for, like, A, is it even going to stay on this one to two foot wide rolling that goes over vert? So it's immediately going to buckle, and right? And your pants are on your ankles, so you can't yeah. even move. Yeah, and I'm reading a paper, right? Is it, <laughs> nothing about this is going to be successful. No. And uh, I, I remember they were building it all day. They were back building the set for this. And I legit, like, wanted no part of knowing how it was going, looking at it. I was really intimidated. And uh, finally, it's like one of the last shots of the day. They get it constructed and they're like, all right, let's run it. And I go up and, and in the skateboarding world, skaters really, in, unless you're riding vert, like don't wear pads. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like a thing. Yeah. And um, I'm getting ready to get up to do this. And, and the severity and reality of the situation is kind of starting to kick in. And I'm like, dude, if, if it goes to the side, I'm, I'm, fucked if it if it buckles immediately and it lands on top of me it, if it shatters and a shard goes into me i don't have a shirt on yeah but i'm about to run it and i'm like dude it'll, two seconds blink of an eye at least it'll be over and they have paramedics on set and, and right before i go knox was like you should put a helmet on and i'm like no not on not on camera yeah. yeah and he's like you should put a helmet on and thank god i listened because that helmet that i put on and it was like one of those old school biker helmets with like the ear like comes down like really i split it wide open oh, like i fuck. split that thing open on the on the edge of the, oh, the no rail? just on the fall mm. just the thud fuck. and my head hitting it legit split that helmet you know and if if i didn't have that on i surely 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 would have split my head open no question and on that slam i, I got a concussion and i broke my ribs but then to make matters worse Previous to this day, I had already kind of started uh, dabbling, I'm speaking this very kindly, w within the drug world. And I had gotten caught up with an addiction that I, I couldn't control anymore. And so I was doing a lot of illegal things. And, and somewhere in my past, I attempted to pass a script uh, from a stolen script pad of a doctor's office for some Percocets in Pennsylvania. Okay. I go in and I. This is before the before the, stunt. the before the stunt. Okay, and and it it kind of has to be told for you yeah. to realize how gnarly this is. So, in my past, before this day, I go to attempt to pass the script, and and I I didn't 
realize what was happening until later, which life is generally live forward and learn backwards. So now what I know to be true is when I attempted to pass that script almost a year before I went into a CVS and I handed the script to the pharmacist and, and they take the script in the back and I think they're filling it. And all of a sudden the pharmacist comes out on the phone and he said, uh, yeah, he's, he's got a, a black leather jacket on. He's wearing a black fedora and he's driving a black Mercedes. So with that, I just bounce. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, the cops are coming. Think nothing more about that. A year later, almost to the day, filming Jagass up the street from where the pharmacy was that I tried to pass this near Bam's house, break my ribs, concussion. They put me in the ambulance. They're taking me to the hospital. And all of a sudden there's a state trooper following us. And they're like, Novak, there's a state trooper. And I'm like, yeah, they're just probably getting us to the hospital quicker. And I get into the hospital with my broken ribs and my concussion. And the state trooper walks in and he said, are you Mr. Novak? I said, yeah. And he said, um, we've been looking for you for almost a year now. We have a, several felony warrants for your arrest and literally just cuffed me to mm -hmm. bed. Like the injury wasn't bad enough. Yeah. Like Damn. talk about insult to injury. And <laughs> yeah. then from there, I, and I was already like addicted to opiates at that point. I was total pill a uh, heroin slash pill addict. I then had to go to jail and sit in there for four days while they processed me. And, and then I had missed out on several other stunts. Damn dude. Because of that. I'm shocked it took them a year to find you because it was not like you were hiding. I know. You're like all over MTV. I didn't MTV even know that stuff. it was like, yeah. I think they just weren't going to put any effort into it until I, because with criminals, you then that, that's why, you know, you violate probation and parole. They never really search for you because odds are you're going to end up on their radar again. So they don't really need so to. So they wanted to wait for an opportunity to make a, a yeah, splash. And, and they don't want to work more, right? Yeah. So they're just going to kind of like wait for you to show up. Did you at least get the uh, the, the care to your, your injury while you were in jail? Yeah, but there's nothing you can really do for broke, ri broke yeah. ribs. You did nothing at all. You made cracked rib, huh? Kind of let it heal, yeah. yeah. Damn, and that's fucking crazy, man. So that's another thing with the skateboarding at 46 or 44 when I put my video part out. I've broken so many bones that like I'm kind of like a walking, talking, uh, weather station. Like I can tell when it's going to rain or snow, I can feel it in my bones, you know? Well, well, give us some sunshine in the forecast today, man. We've, we've had a wet, uh, a wet and overcast winter, uh, down here in Southern California. So I'm ready for some sunshine. But, um, so, uh, I'm curious, man, what, what kind of drugs were you primarily into? You, you said opiates, you said, uh, you were on some painkillers, yeah. a little bit of heroin. Uh, what were the, what were your favorite ones? Heroin. Heroin. Predominantly. Yeah. Heroin yeah. and cocaine. And I would co like shoot speed balls. What's a speed ball? So I graduated to injection and uh, I would shoot up uh, some heroin and cocaine into, you know, I'd cook it together and then put it in. So you get like really. And you, you would smoke it? No, you shoot it intravenously. Shoot it. Okay. Got yeah. it. What so, does that feel like with the both of those two? Uh, it's like, you know, really no words could adequately uh, describe it. It could make, you know, reading the Bible the funnest thing in the world. You know, it, it could make watching paint dry the most interesting sport in the world. You know, it will just enhance the mildest and blandest of things. Yeah. Was there much of a come down with that if you stopped taking it? Yeah, yeah. There was. Which is why I never wanted yeah. to come down. It's I kind used, of a watch, rinse, repeat. Yeah. I used to be addicted to um, Xanax. Yeah, when I, was, I love um, those. When I was young. Yeah. I was probably like... Uh, 2021 and my mindset at the time was like oh it's like you know this is a prescription it's uh you know doctors prescribe this i was i never had anxiety and um you know i was like oh this isn't like cocaine and all these other like hard hard drugs there's no calm down and i was like oh, that's great i can i can still um i can still eat i can still go to work i can function i could go to class and i was in college and i was working uh full-time selling cars at the time and i would like I would do that. I would go to school a little bit. I would do the minimum to get by. I would go. I would go sell cars, and then I would go. Um, I would go party at night, and uh, I quickly became addicted. And so uh, my buddy, my buddy at the time, he worked at a pharmacy, so he would just he would sell me the bottles, the full bottles. I think it was like a hundred in a bottle, I believe. And he's a two milligram full Xanax bars, and uh, quickly became addicted and to the point to where I had to take a, a full bar in the morning just to get out of bed and just to feel normal. And then um, when I got off of work. Uh, I would go out and before I went out and had drinks, I would take another bar. And then if I went out and like partied that night, I would take a third bar. But like, you know, Xanax and alcohol, you black out. You don't remember the whole night. You'll have a great time, 
but the morning would come and like, you'll sleep through alarm clocks. You won't remember anything. And so I remember sleeping through alarm clocks, like showing up two hours late to work. Be like, Hey, what the fuck's going on? Totally. And, uh, dude, I was full blown addicted. And whenever that bottle would get down to like the last like 10, I would start to get anxiety. Cause I'd be like, fuck, like if I didn't take any of those things for like 18 hours, I would start to feel it like really uncomfortable when my palms would get sweaty. I wouldn't want to eat. Time would go by really slow. And, uh, I'd be like, fuck, I gotta go re up. I gotta go re up. And so I remember doing that. And then I was taking, um, I was taking Narcos too. Narcos? Yeah, that's a West Coast thing. West Coast thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Xanax and the Narcos and yeah, I was full one addicted. And then when I got hired um, with the FAA, I was an air traffic controller before I got into real estate investing and entrepreneurship. They were like, hey, um, if you can pass a drug test, we're like, we have you out in Oklahoma City in two weeks. Um, and it ended up being six weeks, but I was like, fuck, I gotta quit. Cause I knew I was gonna go take this job with the government. And I was like, I gotta get, I gotta get clean. So I, I fucking- You just stopped? I just fucking, I weeded myself down. Um, I was taking like, you know, six milligrams a day, which would be about three bars. I weeded it down to like two bars, then one bar. And then I would just take a little bit when I felt like I needed it. And then I just stopped. But dude, it was, it was like six, seven weeks. It was probably two months before I started to feel normal. But like time went by really slow. Um, food tasted like crap. Uh, I couldn't talk. Like I might, I would like just slur my words. I, I couldn't pronunciate my speech. Nothing was like, nothing made me happy. Like there was no joy in life. I was like depressed. I had anxiety and I never had anxiety before any of that. And I was like, that was the hardest drug Quitting out of it. all the drugs I've done. It, it was the anxiety. prescription fucking drug that gave me the most problems. And that's why like now when I hear people like, oh yeah, my doctor's putting me on Xanax. I'm like, no, don't fucking take that shit. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a really long love hate relationship with Xanax. I used to call them, I do call them $5 felonies. Right, because mm, the I bars go for five bucks if you buy them okay. on the street, yep, and, yep. and you take two, three, five, and you, for me, and, and this has been my experience with bars, uh, I used to like to go buy like 180 milligrams of methadone and eat it, two or three Xanax bars, and and it'd be a guaranteed overdose every time. What is the what's the methadone? It's uh it's kind of a a, a form of MAT, uh, medicated assistant uh, treatment uh, that they give you in place of. Uh, it's, you, you go every day, you take a certain milligram and it keeps you off of heroin. And how many Xanax bars would you take in addition? Two or three. Two or three at one time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. but that was just with the methadone. I used to, yeah. I love those. I used to eat a lot. A candy. Yeah. And, uh, but there were also times I'd eat a handful and I'd wake up in a jail cell with like a stack of felonies. Mm. And I'm like, what? And then I saw the $5 felonies. Um, cause I had yeah, no idea what crazy. I had done. Like you were talking about yeah. no recollection of the night before, but Zen, uh, you know, benzos. And alcohol are the two most dangerous withdrawals that literally are the only two you can die yeah, and from. Yeah, Xanax is a benzo. Yes. You feel like you'll die from heroin and, and, and things of that nature. But but those two are the absolute dangerous. Um, you go into a psychosis, you have seizures, and you start hallucinating. Um, at one point, I was coming off Xanax and I was feeding a, an imaginary pig that was following me around that I'd named Minson. Um, I, I had... I was in this treatment center that was an all male facility and um, I was 12 days clean and I forgot to tell them that I was taking Xanax prior to entering because it wasn't really my issue. My issue at the time was heroin. I was selling a lot of Xanax, so I was just eating them. Uh, I had a, you know, a never ending supply of them and, and 12 days after being clean in this treatment center, I started hallucinating and thinking that my, my roommate was hooking up with my girlfriend who was in the same room. Now, mind you, this is an all male facility. There's no women in it. And, and I, I destroy all his clothing. I rip it up. I uh. believe that this is happening. They, they discharge me from that program. And I go back to my mother's house. She doesn't know what to do with me. They take me to the hospital and they give me a spinal tap and, and they, they realize that I'm coming off of all these benzos. So they do what you did was they prescribe me a handful of Xanax and my mother dispense them to me to come off, wean me off of. But I remember being in, um, in, in, I was a danger to myself and she'd have to like sleep with me in bed at night to make sure that I wouldn't harm myself. And I remember one night coming to still totally hallucinating and thinking that she was just this random woman in my bed. And I like attempted to like make out with her, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Like that's she, crazy. Yeah. And I do, I told that story. I haven't talked about this in a while. I told that story on the Howard Stern show years ago and uh, how I had tried to hook up with my mother coming off of Xanax because I was withdrawing and hallucinating and I thought she was just a woman in my bed. And then a few days later after being in New York doing the Stern show, it's Mother's Day and I 
go to Baltimore to take my mother out and we're at this really nice Italian restaurant and this gentleman next to us said, you're that guy. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I just heard you on the Stern Show talking about how you tried to hook up with your... And, then, and you're at my lunch with your mom. Right? Oh my God. Your mom got to laugh yeah, at it a yeah, bit. Yeah, dude, she gets me. She yeah. totally gets it. But yeah, that's, that's, you know, some of the most dangerous withdrawals you could have for sure. Yeah. I think doctors are, are the worst drug dealers out. Not all of. I'm not generalizing that statement, but because like you said, you know, it, it, they're so easily prescribed and there's always a pharmaceutical antidote or answer to any ailment. It's just, you know, welcome to democracy 101, right? And bureaucracy, like that's just how the world works. Big pharma, dude. It's, totally. a, it's, a, it's a multi-billion it dollar industry. And, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest protest against big pharma would be if everyone focused on health and fitness. For sure. They would hate it if everyone got fit, um, but they don't want They'd that. They'd be out of business. They would be completely yeah, out of business. it doesn't support their, you know, their narrative. So, you know, you get a young kid who comes in and, and, and has anxiety or has sprained his knee. They're so quick to throw a, a benzo, an opiate, to prescribe, to, to fix it. It's financially driven, motivate it. And then all of a sudden they believe the kid's better, but now he's, he's picked up this physical and mental obsession and need for these pills. And yeah. the doctor cuts him off. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great from the doctor's perspective. And maybe I am healed, but like tell that to, to this physical addiction and mental obsession I've now, you know, have going on within my body that tells me I need more. I'm sick. I, the the withdrawals that you were talking about, dude, the worst, man. And that and that was me being a 20 year old kid that was naive, thinking, oh, I'm actually doing good. I'm I'm For not sure. doing cocaine. I'm Your not doing all these other were drugs. Proper ecstasy and all these other things that um, I was like, oh, this is you know, this is prescribed. It's artificial. The the pharmacy company, the pharmaceutical companies manufacture this. It's got to be good for you. Right. You go and, to a uh, hospital. And sure a guy enough, in a it was the, gives it to you. It was the roughest thing I've ever come down off yeah. of. And, um, I wouldn't wish you know, I, I didn't, enemy. I didn't know. And it's probably a good thing I didn't know at the time, but I remember listening to uh, Dr. Drew on the radio while I was kind of at the, the tail end of this six or seven week recovery. And, um, he was talking, someone called and this lady said, Hey, like I'm coming down off of the Xanax. Like, what should I do? And she was like, you need to go see help because you can have seizures. Like, this is a serious thing. I was like, fuck, I got lucky. And for me, I couldn't tell anyone because um, I was taking this job at the FAA and they ask you like, hey, have you ever done any drugs? And so like, it would disqualify me if I like checked myself in. So I was like, I don't want any of that risk. So I was like, I'm not gonna tell anyone. And um, so anyway, so I never did it again. And then I, I went to get LASIK procedure on my eyes like four, four years ago. And um, they gave me a Xanax. That was the first time I ever took it since. They gave me a Xanax before the procedure and it gave me like flashbacks. Like yeah. my, my brain was like, oh, I remember this. Totally. Yeah, it's weird, dude. I just got a, um, I got a, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, what's it called when they go up? Uh, a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy. Yeah. I just got that and they put me on the anesthesia. And I remember going and, and as soon as they put it in me, I looked at the lady and I'm like, I used to love this feeling. Mm. And that was the last thing I remember saying and <laughs> went out. You know, yeah, it took yeah. my, my body and brain doesn't recognize like, as prescribed when needed. Yeah. So, but that's the beautiful thing and the importance about like raising awareness. People are, you were ignorant to that information at your age, going to the doctor, naively accepting Xanax when really there was probably an alternative method that would have easily like cured that ailment as opposed to Xanax to a kid that took you down that road. But like, why would you know any better? Because no one's really talking about it. So ignorance is bliss at that point in time. But now, God willing, someone out there is hearing this conversation and now they have this awareness, this heightened sense of awareness to be like, you know, maybe like there's a workaround. If you love real estate investing, passive income and tax benefits, but don't have the time, my company Summers Capital is buying boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even handle all the day-to-day -day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, visit summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. I think a lot of um, a lot of problems can be solved, and I'm not speaking for everyone, but yeah. generally speaking, I think a lot of problems can be solved by uh, health and fitness and growth and progress. And for what do I mean sure. that? by that? I mean, like, you know, for me, I didn't realize this until recently, um, but like happiness stems from growth and progress. And so if I'm working on my body, I'm in the gym, I'm getting more fit, I'm getting results, I'm going to be happy. If I'm working on the business, I'm growing, 
uh, in all these different buckets. And it's not just the business. It could be relationships, friends, family, uh, mindset. As long as I'm progressing each week and getting a little bit better, that's ultimately what makes me happy. A lot of people say like, oh, like I'm, I can't go to the gym because I'm depressed. It's like, well, maybe you're depressed because you're not going to the gym. Dude, There's two ways to look at it. That's man. I've been talking about that so much. Uh, I own a treatment center now. I run groups every morning with the clients and I've been talking about for the last week that I'll kind of hone in on something and, and it just embodies me and I just live by it. And what I've been saying over and over is that the, the magic that we're in search of is in the work that we're avoiding in every area of life. Say that one more time. Think about it. The magic that we're in search of is in the work that we are avoiding. Mm, that's so good. I'm, I'm a product of that environment. But it comes down to perspective, right? Like, who are you surrounding yourself that will help guide and create your mentality to have a, a realistic perspective that will yield a better outcome, right? God doesn't understand the difference between a prayer and a fucking complaint, right? I believe and I know from my experience, my mentality will create my reality. So who I surround myself, who I walk with is who I am. And when COVID hit, my solution to that was like, oh no, I better like go to the hospital, get these checkups. Not saying that I am a PhD, I, I'm a doctor, I possess the, I have no answers. I have none. I, I just have my experience. What's led to this exact moment, which is my present and I treat it as such, was I chose to double down on health and wellness, right? Because they said the billboard for COVID is like, you know, obese, dietary supplements, shit, you know, fatigue, smoking. So I like was like, all right, well, I'm going to work out more. I'm going to eat better. I, I didn't buy into the narrative of, oh, let me go get some kind of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical something to, I just, you know, and, be, and then what happened was I started going to the gym, not because I wanted to, uh, to, to, to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I went for my mental health, right? The world started to shut down as we knew it. I was questioning everything. Um, and again, I'm not pro or, or not COVID. This is just my experience. Did you take the uh, vaccine? I did not. I, and in the beginning, I, I'm very considerate and I respect the rules of it. You know, I had the mask, I did the gloves in the beginning. And then I kind of saw, started seeing it from a different perspective. But I started like working out more for my mental health because I was questioning everything. Like what direction is the world going in? Um, is my mother going to die? Is everything that I've worked hard for going to disappear? Am I going to like every, everyone was, but I started going to the gym and I started really working out for my mental health. And what happened is I started to feel better. And in the process of starting to feel better mentally, I started to look better physically. And from that, I started to wanted to do better overall in society and realized that like, you know, how I looked and the work that was produced was all a byproduct of the, the work that I was doing in the gym to fix the mental health. That's so good, dude. But I didn't realize it at the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was like, dude, I just gotta do something besides. And I also was like practicing controlled media consumption because I knew the longer that I went down that rabbit hole, the more I would question everything and the, the less I would trust in my God. Yeah. And there was a lot of propaganda. A lot of media was being pushed out. Um, I stopped watching the news in Same. 2020. And since then, I, I haven't really picked it back up, to be honest with you. I'm with you. And, and it's, it's brilliant, except for when I find myself in a conversation with some like worldly people about current events. Yeah. And, you're like, and I'm just, going. I know nothing. I bring yeah. nothing to the table. And I'm like, I, was, I legit live in my own world. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm actually going, I'm going, going out to dinner tonight with a female who, uh, she does a lot of like politics and like world news and like all this current events. So I'm like, fuck, I don't watch the news. I'm like, I might have to like study some notes before I go into this dinner. Just so I have a couple topics to talk about. For sure. But I also like, you know, uh, I'm not religious by any means, but I'm insanely spiritual. Okay. And it's like, where's my spirituality if I judge your spirituality or your beliefs? Because for me, in the practices that I work, acceptance is the answer to everything, right? Like good, bad, or indifferent. And I believe that God has created his children exactly as they are intended to be, which are ultimately my brothers and sisters. So if I cast judgment um, on what your belief is or the direction I believe you're headed in, how dare I? You know, because if anybody, if anybody would have robbed me of my process, I would not be 
the child of God that I am today, meaning that I saw my higher power. And God can be a very discouraging word. And I don't want to turn this into a Bible thumping deal because that's not me at all. I don't even really believe in organized religion. But again, that's just my deal. Um, I believe my higher power is everything. I believe it's death. I believe it's destruction. I believe it's birth. I believe it's, you know, the gloomy days, the sunny days. I Because it, it all kind of coexists and yeah. the yin to the yang. And dude, and, and to your point, man, like it's, it's kind of crazy to look back and think of it now, but this was normal four years ago where, uh, you know, we, you go, to, I remember I have season tickets to the San Diego Padres. And I remember going to baseball games when they opened back up and they had segregated seats. So as a season ticket holder, I, I didn't get vaccinated and, and I'll explain here in a second why, but, um, because of that, they, I couldn't even sit in my season seat. They put me like all over and they would space everyone out. They had, um, they had vaccinated sections and they had non-vaccinated sections. It was like segregation all over again from, you know, from back in the day. And then, and then they, they said, Hey, you can't go to like certain sporting events. You couldn't go to certain concerts. And that's when I decided, I'm like, well, I'm going to get a fake vaccine card. And so that's what I ended up doing. And um, I was able to go do those kind of things. But my whole thing with the vaccination was this. And uh, I supported it, uh, whether you wanted to get vaccinated or you didn't. I just felt like for me, and people were shunning others, at, by the mm -hmm. way, at the time. I remember this. Yeah. This was a big thing. And uh, for me, um, I felt like uh, as a guy in his, his mid-30s, relatively healthy, I had already had COVID. And um, I had recovered from it. And I felt like the chances of me getting it again and actually dying from it were, were very, very, very low. And so I decided um, not to get it. And uh, my take on it at the end of the day is like, I feel like, you know, if you want to get it, you should get it. If not, no. But I just feel at the end of the day, for all the people that are shunning people about the vaccine, I think that at the end of the day, us as Americans should have the decision of what medicine we decide to put or not put in our bodies. And that's it. For sure. That's it. Without the bullying and scrutiny of other opinions. I couldn't agree more. I mean, none of us have the answer. We don't. We don't. To, to that outbreak, to addiction, to alcoholism, right? If any of us did, we'd bottle it up, we'd sell it, we'd be a billionaire a billion times over. We're all doing the best that we can with what we have. At the end of the day, we are human beings, not human doings, right? And this thing, this, 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 this weird thing called, uh, you know, <laughs> reality, which is an acquired taste, didn't come with an instruction manual. Mine did through my family, my mother and father. And what that looked like for me is my father taught me one thing. If and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. He was around just enough to let me know he wasn't around. He never held a job a day in his life. And he taught me one thing. If and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. My mother, you know, held everything together and, and ultimately became a very successful woman in her own right, a, a nuclear physicist on the board of Mercy Hospital. But the truth of the matter is, you know, they were doing the best that they could with what they had. She was doing enough just to keep the, the lights on and a roof over our head while my, my father, who ran with the Hells Angels, um, didn't get our house raided for making meth and selling coke, who ultimately died from uh, an addiction to crack. You know, so it's like I had a lot of resentment towards that man for a long time. How could he? How dare he? It's because of him I became this. And, and the truth of the matter is I was seeing a therapist once, and she said, I want you to, to dig two graves. And I said, for what? And she said, one for you and for one, one for all those resentments that you're carrying on your back. And that made a lot of sense to me. You know, like, we're all just trying, I hope, I really hope and believe, to do the best that we can with what we have. And if you are, which I believe, uh, one of God's children, that makes you my brother or sister. So how dare I, like, come at you with a, a harboring a resentment because you're not doing as I expect you should do. Yeah. Not just, you know, if, if my higher power is the loving, almighty, you know, and again, I don't want to discourage anyone with that word, God, that's an intimidating word. I don't, I just, I, I don't know what it is. If it's a man, a woman, the, the universe, the ocean, the sun, I just know it's not fucking me. Mm -hmm. It's a power greater than myself. That isn't me. Yeah. One, one of my favorite lines is, uh, kindness is the highest form of discipline. And, um, no, I just, I'm not, I'm not religious and all this stuff. And I support all these religions. Um, I just believe in being a, a kind human being and, and treating everyone with respect. That's and that, it. And that's it. People underestimate the power of a smile. Mm. God forbid I received a call that my mother just passed away. That'd be the worst news I could ever receive. 
But if in that moment or shortly thereafter, you could say something to put a smile on my face, mm -hmm. then put a price tag on it. Yeah. You know, a simple smile can literally change the direction of one's life. Dude, you'd be surprised, man. Like, uh, and I agree with that. Like, you walking by strangers on the sidewalk, how few of people actually like smile and say hi. Sometimes I just I just say hi because I it's everyone. And and I used to work at a kiosk in the in the mall selling cell phones when I was 18 years old. I was forced to say hi to everyone. That was that was how we we sold cell phones. And so now I'm just so used to it. I'm just hey, I'm just a friendly dude, like old old young guy, girl, whatever. I'm just like hey, how you doing, whatever. And uh, you'd be surprised, like some people, they then they don't even say hi back. They just like put their head down and walk by. I'm like, fuck, that's crazy to me. And you know? it's you can, I I don't even fault those people because who were their mentors? Mm -hmm. Who were their teachers? Yeah, it's free right? to say hi. It's free to smile. It is, and it goes a it goes a long way. I, I do have a question for you. So I, I saw on your uh, your Instagram, uh, you were talking about a story how uh, you were renting a a mattress for like 10 bucks a night or something. And some homeless lady tried to stab you. Yeah. What the fuck happened there? Yeah, man? I got stabbed in the head with it. You got pen. stabbed. Dude, that's crazy. At like 5 AM. What, what, what were you doing in the first place in, in this joint? So I was renting a room in an abandoned house in East Baltimore. And, and how old were you at this time? I was. 24-ish. Okay. So this is before the Jackass days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before Jackass, before Viva La Bam, before even the CKY, I believe. Yeah, so this is before that. And I'm um, at the peak of my addiction and, and I'm living in this abandoned house and this guy who owns the abandoned house is named Slim. So we'd have to pay Slim 10 bucks a night to have access to a room in this abandoned house. And they'd run electricity uh, from the neighbor's house, extension cords, and, or up the street. And uh, one night, me and two other people are sharing this room. And, and we're getting ready to leave. It's like 5 in the morning. And, and we go down the stairs, and we're going out the front door. And in the main living room, which, again, there's no electricity at this point in that living room, there's uh, milk crates on the ground. And they have a, a, piece, of ply, uh, a, a piece of plywood on the, the milk crates. And they have candles lit and they're smoking crack around it. And there's this woman who has this stroller and she, there's a baby in this stroller and the baby's kind of crying. They're smoking crack. It's five in the morning in this abandoned house. Damn, that's crazy. Smoking crack Legit. with a baby in a stroller. A baby in the stroller. It's still dark out they're, they're I write about it in my book and, and these candles, we would buy these candles from the little Chinese store bodega for 10 cents a piece. That's how we would kind of make it through the night. Cause you couldn't see. Yeah, Start. you couldn't see. You had to have the candles. And you'd continue to be getting high, so you need to, like, cook your stuff up. Mm. You know, so it was just good to keep it lit the whole time. And we could afford that 10 cents, right? Yes. And um, and leave. And I had $10 stashed in my sock, which I always saved for the morning so I could get more dope. Kind of like you took your Xanax in the morning to feel normal. Yeah. I had to have that. To just feel, to feel normal. Just to feel, like, what I thought we feel like now. Yeah, right. Little did I know it was not even close. Yeah. Um. But they, somehow they knew and they called, my two friends were outside and they called me back in and I go in and they start like asking me for money as I don't have it, I don't have it. And then the woman that's holding the baby, she had just got out of rehab. So she was like bigger and kind of, she hadn't used for 30 days or so. So she had some weight to her and she's holding me and they're searching me and I'm fighting. And, and I hear the other girl say, give me the knife, give me the knife. And I would not give this $10 up. It was my lifeline. Baby's crying, they're smoking crack, the, the sun's starting to come up. Give me the knife. And she gets what I think is the knife. And all of a sudden I feel this puncture in my head and it twice. And then I like kind of grab it out of it and it's an ink pen. And at that point, when I knew that they were not going to stop, I was easily overpowered because the woman was big. She just got out of rehab. I then gave the $10 up and ran out. Fuck, dude. That's crazy, man. What, what was going through your head, man? I'm curious because, you know, when I used to party when I was younger, like 18, 19, 20, I always, when the sun's coming up, I'd be like, fuck, like, what am I fucking doing with my life? Did you, did you get a lot of those thoughts back then? Like, you're living in a fucking crack house, no electricity, smoking crack, there's babies, stroller. Uh, like, what, what was going through your head, man? Well, at that time in my life, I was really disconnected from reality, mm -hmm. right? Again, at that time, my abnormal became the normal, right? Like that was the, the way the world yeah. works. So you didn't have those thoughts. But 
far and few in between, I would have those. And, and what that would look like is I would come to in the morning, um, whenever, whatever I was on wore off and I'd get that brief moment of clarity, right? Because the whole reason why I got high for so long is it would allow me every time I injected a drink or a drug, however I did it, it would produce this effect, this delusional effect that without fail would allow me to escape the reality that I created for myself. Right. So now shoot a big speedball. Not only is homeless homelessness in living in an abandoned house bearable, it's actually like pretty attractive. It's appealing, right? Like, I, like I started this out, it can make reading the Bible or watching paint dry the funnest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So, so I continue to get high to escape this miserable existence that I have created for myself as a direct result to my addiction. But then I'd come to, and all of a sudden I'd see my life for what it really looked like was. And that's when it was imperative for me to get another drink or drug in me, despite any and all adverse consequences that came my way, which is why I always did what I had to do in order to get what I needed to get. And if you ever, you, a person, place, or thing ever attempted to stand between me and that drink or drug, you must and would go by any and all means necessary. And it was never personal. It was always just business because I was a really good kid. I was raised with morals, values. I had a heart. I, I was shown love. I was taught how to be compassionate and considerate. But then when that thing took hold of me, it created this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. How come that at that point it was no longer personal? It's just business because I didn't want to do what I had to do to get that next one. But the reality and severity of my addiction, truth be told, is once I'm under the influence, I no longer have the ability or pleasure to have a say-so in what I do or don't do in my life. It's, it, it's instantaneously, that's where it takes me to. Yeah, right? that's like, powerful. That's, that's the truth of the matter with my story. And I didn't always, I couldn't understand how, because I was an intel, I am an intelligent guy, right? Like I, I always was the guy that if I believed it, I could see it, not the other way around. And and um, I couldn't understand how I would get beaten so bad by my addiction, right? Like my father was an addict; he died of addiction. I actually kind of excelled at everything I did in my life to prove a point why I would never become that bum. At the time, I had these resentments. Now I don't feel that way about him. I totally accept and forgive him, although he's no longer with us. But I was always going to prove why I would never be that man, ever, ever, ever. And lo and behold, I became him tenfold. I made him look like chump change. And I couldn't understand how. And again, learned way later in life after I was blessed with sobriety, the reason why I got beat so bad by my opponent, AKA addiction, every time I stepped in the ring is because I always fucking underestimated it, right? Like. Being so intelligent, I don't know about you, but for the majority of my life, I possessed this job and this job would place me in a lot of positions I didn't like to be in and it allowed me to feel a lot of feelings I didn't like to feel. And that job consisted of knowing everything, right? So when you suggested to me what I could ultimately do to save my life, I'd suggest why you should fuck off because I know. And then you look at my resume, it states that I do know some shit because I've done some things in life that at this point, skateboarder, you know, jackass, Viva La Bam, uh, published author, written some addiction memoirs, did some shit that people would equate to success. Yeah. So I, I got a question about that. I want to talk about that. Yeah. So like, okay. and, and you've been sober now for how long? Seven years? I just celebrated nine years a couple nine days years. ago. Congrat congratulations. Yeah. That's big time. Yeah. So I haven't drank in, today's day 32. Fuck and yeah. I'm 38 years old. I Damn. never once, I never once in my lifetime, you know, took a break or anything like that, not even for like a week. What created this break? What, what was I'll the straw that broke and, and I'll tell back. you why, and this is what I want to talk about with you. Um, because I, I realized that at 38, I'm like, you know what? I'm never going to know what my true potential is and how far I can truly go within business and, and as an entrepreneur um, and as a human being uh, if I'm going out and, and partying two or three times a week, going out and having drinks. And like I was telling you before we started recording, like too often just one glass of wine would turn into, you know, a really late night. And so um, I realized what's in front of me and I'm like, I want to, I want to see how far I can go. And in order to give myself the best chance to, to get there, um, I need to be operating at 110% every single day, sunrise, 
to the time I go to bed. And, you know, I was on average, I was, you know, drinking two to three times a week. Um, but that's two to three times a week where I'm operating at, you know, 40, 50% the next day. And, um, you know, that compounded over weeks, months, and years really, really sets you back. And, um, and so I, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna try 14 days and see what it's like. That was and, my question. Um, Did you give yeah. yourself a timeline? No, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do something that was like, uh, a hundred days and be like, man, this is gonna be tough. I was like, let me just do something that's manageable. You can conceive that. Yeah. 14 days, two weeks. And, and actually, um, it's funny, dude. So like my barber, uh, shout out to, um, my barber. He's like the best barber in San Diego. He used to come in here every Friday and he was to cut me up and, uh, and he, he was drinking every night. Uh, he was overweight and right when he started coming in here, he was like, dude, uh, I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to get in the gym and he stopped drinking and literally like three months into it, he's like, dude, I can't come see you anymore. I bought my own shop. And so now I go into his shop and, um, I was just coming off a week to where I had done three late nights in one week. And one of them was actually with one of our investors and I went out for dinner with one of our investors and we ended up going really late. And I was like, dude, I, I had three late nights, really late nights in one week. And it was coming off the third one, and I'm like waking up late. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing, dude? And I went in to go get a haircut with him, and I was asking him about his sobriety. And he's like, dude, it's fucking changed my life. He's like, I lost 30 pounds. I fucking bought my own barbershop. He's like, my relationship with my family, my kids is way better. He's like, there's no negatives. And uh, I was like, dude, I think I need to like try it for a little bit. Dude, I have to call, cut you real quick right there. This is that full circle moment. If you recall how we started this out, right? Ignorance is bliss. When you don't know, you're not to be held accountable for. But when you start surrounding yourself with people who genuinely like want to do better in life and mm -hmm. you spot it, you got it, you can start recognizing yeah. the, the alignment and timing, right? Like you weren't there at that point, but he was, and he decided to do it. And then timing and alignment, we went for a haircut, felt like shit, had a late night, and remember that what he said and then see what he's produced as a direct result of his sobriety. It then got you to a point where like, Maybe I might want to do it. looked appealing to you. Yeah, 100%, and, dude. 100%. And, dude, and that's, dude, that's powerful. In that past week, I had gone out with one of our investors at like dinner, and um, I didn't realize it was going to be a late night, but it became a late night. You know how it goes. And I remember coming in here like off of like maybe two hours of sleep, and I got three podcast guests flying into town. I'm like, what, if, what the fuck am I doing, man? You know? And, and I think what was an enabler for me is like I was able to like still be good enough you know, like, like you were like, you're doing skateboarding stuff. You're on MTV and all this stuff. And so a lot of people will see me like, oh, like you're, you're killing it. You're killing it. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah. It boosts me up. I'm like, oh, like I can go out and party and have a good time. But dude, man, I'm only 32 days in and it is the, it is the biggest life hack that no one talks about. Like my fitness is fucking dialed. My body is changing every single day. I'm getting stronger. I'm working on the business more. Um, I'm a better leader now. Like all my relationships are better. And the one limiting belief I had was I always thought if I didn't drink, I couldn't go out in the nightlife. And I couldn't go out and still have fun and socialize. And I always thought I had to sit at home and be like FOMO, just like sitting at home bored. And that is not the fucking case. I've been going at my social life has doubled because now, dude, like before I would have to pick and choose my spots. I'd be like, people invite me out to dinner and then there'd be like networking events and all these things. And I'd be like, I knew that alcohol would set me back. So I'd be like, ah, oh, no, I'm not going to make that dinner. Right now, since I'm not drinking, I can go make all these dinners and like go show up to a dinner for two hours, socialize, have a great time. And then I'm home in bed by 10 o'clock and I'm in the gym the very next morning and I'm ripping on the business and I'm able to go do all these social events now and have even more of a better time because I'm more dialed, I'm more present, my conversations are better. And then I get to the end of the weekend, dude, and I'm like, I've had the most productive weekend. I did way more socializing than I would even when I was partying. And I remember every single bit of the weekend and I still have free time. It's the biggest fucking life hack that no one talks about, dude. Dude, you just encompassed what recovery can look like depending on how someone wants to go about it right there's in this world of sobriety recovery harm reduction there's no margin for error yet it's impossible to do perfect because no one has the answer right we're simply trying to just be a little bit better today than we were yesterday and what you said i live by and that is and the viewers can i'm proving a point you just said it sobriety has given us everything that alcohol promised us mm -hmm. right we become this better version of ourselves i i own a treatment center i own sober living houses and i tell to the individuals that i'm working with on a daily basis that struggle with this internal void or fight like how can i be part of i'm going to miss out on you know 
I heard this one woman share. She said, every time I drank, it made me prettier, wittier, and tittier. And that's what alcohol does, right? Like, mm -hmm. it just fills me full of, like, this false fucking confidence. And, and uh, what happens is, I always say to them, if you can tell me one bad thing, literally one bad thing that can come from getting sober... I'll drive you to the bar. And I'm as open-minded as they can get. And I have yet to been given. And I stand by that. That's so I truly good. stand by that. Alcohol recovery, if we're blessed to find it, it literally becomes our superhuman power. It will set us apart from the majority of the world. It does it in active addiction, but it will also do it in sobriety. It will make us outwork everybody. It will make us outlove everybody. It will make us outperform everybody. It will make us outlast everybody. I'm a testament to that. Like, if this isn't magical and spiritual, I don't know what is. It's the only thing that I'm aware of where your poison becomes your medicine. Mm. It happened for you. You just yeah. shared about it. Yeah. And, and, and I, I saw it. I was if like home, going into this. In correctly. Yeah, going into this, I was like, you know what? Like, and that's at 32 days. You, the yeah, fog hasn't days. even lifted. Every day it gets better. My memory gets better. My speech gets better. Like everything is you better. You still but... don't even see clearly yet. Yeah. That's how you. And and it's um, it's the 32 days is the roughest. I said before. I'll say it again. It, it takes so much longer to get 32 days sober than it will take to get 32 months or years sober. But once you fall into to line and get the rhythm of it, it like it becomes second nature. Yeah. Um. But I gotta say. You know, it's for me, and this is speaking for me, um, it's been a lot easier than I thought. It's actually been really, really easy. And I think it's because I'm doing it for me and I'm very aligned with why I'm doing it, right? I'm like building my shit. I'm doing it because I'm trying to become the best version of myself that I possibly can. And I'm not doing it just because I know I should stop drinking. I'm doing it because I want to become the best version of myself. And I know I'm not going to become that best version and live to my full potential if I'm out drinking and, and having late nights, three nights a week. So what I see your late nights to be with your investors where you drank and it kind of got out of control, out of hand, and it was producing a result that you weren't a fan of is uh, you simply being divinely inconvenienced, right? Because then it allows you to create or tap into this inner power that without those nights that you weren't okay with, you wouldn't have been blessed with this result. Yeah, because right? it's all perspective, man. It's all perspective. It really, and they taught me in treatment that if I change my perception, I could change my world. Yes. And then from skateboarding, right? No was never an option. Failure was unacceptable. Um, my, I knew that my mentality could create reality, it, but I didn't know it at the time. But then once I tapped into, to sobriety and had my spiritual experience, did I learn that like I can do anything. Yeah, I can dude, do anything. That's how I fucking feel, man. My Mark my words. My confidence has gone up every single day. I feel like I can and run through a And not in an egotistical way, yeah. but like legit. Yeah. It, 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 may, it makes you so much more confident. Like every single day you're operating at 110% and the confidence level go, gets better every day. Um, but lastly, I'll say this, man. Like I went out to Vegas two weekends ago. I bought table bottle service. I'm not even drinking. But I can be around it, you know, and I've, I've gone out here. I've gotten tables here because I love going out. It's part of my who I am. And I love socializing. And then around the time of night where people start repeating their stories to me, they start slowing their words. That's when I'm like, all right, I'm going to cut out and go to bed. But like those four or five hours leading up to it, great, great time. And then, you know, at midnight, like nothing good happens after that hour anyways. That's when I'm like, all right, I'm going to bounce. You Dude, know, my it's mother, my, it's so funny you just yeah. said that. My mother raised me as these things uh, when I was a kid that I live by today. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't steal. You don't drink. You don't drug. And nothing good happens after midnight. Yeah. That's like, good. That's and good that's one. literally at 46 how I try to to live my life. I at four years sober, I went to Amsterdam to an AA meeting and picked up my four year medallion. People do not equate Amsterdam and recovery. That's, yeah, no. It's like no. it fucking it doesn't coincide. But once you do those things, it's like it gives you even more confidence. You're like, oh, this is no no big deal, right? I legit for the majority of my life lived in this four block radius that consisted of my prison that cost me ten dollars to get out of one bag at a time right like i just stayed in this really small area and just wash rinse repeat and then i found sobriety and what i've learned uh, through my spiritual experience because the definition of a spiritual experience is simply a psychic change meaning that i brandon novak today no longer look at things the way i did then um 
is that I'm a free man that can go anywhere with anybody at any time. And I am no longer tempted by a drink or a drug. But that's for me because I, I, I have a very healthy relationship with my higher power who did for me what I or no human power was ever capable of doing, which was to lift me of the obsession and rid me of the desire to continue to drink and drug. Because there were many days when I did not want to use, but I didn't have the, the luxury to have a say-so in the matter. I had to. And because of that, honing in on it, I, I remain proactive in my journey with my, my spirituality and my recovery. And, and, and I, it's such a freeing experience that if I could give a piece of what I have to anybody, I believe they'd be like, what the fuck did I stay stuck on stupid so long for? But the most freeing part about this is I got to where I'm at today by simply admitting that what I do know is that I have no idea, right? Because then at that moment, when I relinquished complete control, I secured the ultimate victory and became an open-minded, teachable individual, which I never did before because I possessed that job that consisted of knowing everything. I, I dumbed my way into this. Yeah. Do you, do you ever look back and wonder like, uh, cause it's, it's imp really impressive all the things you accomplished in the skateboarding world, uh, you know, while you were doing all this stuff, cause the game I'm playing today, I can play for the next 30, 40 years. Right. And so now, uh, especially the, since I'm not drinking, I'm, I'm going to really, really yeah. see how You're far I can go. You're about to tap into things that you have no idea exist. You were a beast before. Now you're going to become like a beast on steroids. Like, no, I know. Insane. They don't even know. No. And, uh, and I'm fact. realizing this right now. It's a whole new level just unlocked. And I'm like, let's fucking yeah. go. Yeah. Um, but for you, do you ever look back and be like, fuck, like, um, what would my skateboarding look like back then if you weren't doing the party? No. You don't regret it I, at all? I don't. You know, the, I, I used to say the only thing that I regret was the pain and the sleepless nights that I caused my loved ones. But after thinking a bit more about that, I don't regret that either. Because if there were never repercussions from my actions, you wouldn't uh, be who you are exactly. today. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, I and now have, you're inspiring today, a lot of people. I devote my life. Yeah. literally to help those who are where I once was. I, 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 I'm in the thick of it. As a matter of fact, I'm just as much, if not more consumed by drugs and alcohol today than I was when I was caught up in active addiction. What do you mean by that? I'm surrounded by it. I'm in the thick of it. I'm an interventionist. Yeah. Uh, I'm a motivational speaker. I own treatment centers. I own sober living houses. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm constantly surrounded by drugs in one way, shape or form. The only difference is, is that today I don't use them and they provide an amazing life for me. That if is, that is not a, a blessing. I don't know what is. Uh, for a listener out there that's like, Hey, you know what? Um, it's time to me. It's time for me to take a little break from the drinking, um, see what the sober life's all about. Would you recommend committing to it? Like long-term be like, Hey, this is it. Or would you say, do what I did? Like, let me just commit to something that's easy, manageable, 14 days. And if you get to the 14 days, you're either going to love it and you're going to keep doing it for, for your own reasons. Totally. Because you're going to want it. Or would you, or would you say, fuck it, just do the, the commit to it for good. Dude, anybody out there now that's caught up in active addiction or alcoholism and is thinking about, you know, entertaining the notion of getting sober and staying sober the rest of their life. It's the equivalent in their brain of trying to climb Mount Everest with no hands or feet or eyes. It's that fucking overwhelming. So what I do is just like, fuck that noise, quiet that down one step at a time. Yeah. Just pick the phone up and call me. That's one step at a time. And then from there, we'll figure out what the next step is. Because at that moment, you know, you're trying to figure out all these moving pieces and, 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 uh, a, a point particular individuals to roles that have to play to create this outcome. And it's, it just seems like a never ending uh, daunting task. That's yeah, it's I agree. not doable. So it's like, just start by picking the phone up because again, if I could have done this on my own, I would have truth of the matter is anyone caught up in that game with addiction or alcoholism is fighting a fixed fucking fight. No one wins. No one wins until you admit defeat. It's a mind fuck. Because who wants to admit defeat anywhere in life? No. You know? I and feel you, man. When I look back, what I learned, all I did for the better part of 15 years, doing it on my own because I was the great I am and I had to suffer in silence because I couldn't let you know the reality of my situation because what would that do to my manhood or my professional career or my ego um, is I suffered in silence. And, and all I did 
was just rearrange the furniture on the Titanic for like 15 years. My ship sank every goddamn time. And the moment I was like, you know what? Show me who you walk with, I'll tell you who you are. I can't do this, but like these people at these meetings and at these treatment centers who every time I, I go and try to seek help, they're there. And they have wives, they have homes, their their shit's not being put out in trash bags every night and they're clean and they don't stink and they have money. Maybe they have a better idea about this thing called life. So powerful. Maybe like you said, the common denominator in every one of your problems before thirty four days just ago one was one glass of wine. Yep. Mine was me. I was always the common denominator in my problem. You know? It's just funny because all I had to do was just admit that I don't know. Yeah, I feel you, man. Well, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, I love everything that you're doing. You're inspiring a lot of people. You're helping a lot of people get off uh, their addictions and, and back into a whole new uh, world, uh, a world that um, for a lot of people don't even realize exists. Yeah. And so, Congrats um, to you, man. I'm so, you, so proud of you. I'm, I appreciate I'm truly you. grateful to be here. I could talk about this stuff for like days. Yeah, man. appreciate you, brother. Um, where can the folks get in touch with you? If anyone's out there and they need help or want to entertain what that may look like, it starts with a simple phone call and you can reach me directly at 610-314-6747. Myself or John will answer that call and we will do everything in our power to get you the help that you deserve, not what you fucking need. There it is. I love it. He's Brandon Novak. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Love you.